What I am here to talk to you about are analog computers and long-term trust. And, and what I mean by long-term trust is I mean how can you have assurance that your Bitcoin secrets, your, your seed words or your seed phrase or, or whatever have you, how can you be assured that that is stored correctly, you know, that, that the data have integrity and so on, and how can you be assured of that for a long time, right? And so where trust comes into this is that traditionally, in the last hundred years, in order to verify the integrity of data, you have to put it into some sort of electronic computer, right? And in doing so, you then have to trust that those computers are you know, not doing horrible things. They're not leaking your data. They're not destroying it. They're not lying to you when they say that it's the right data, and, and so on and so forth. And I propose that you can avoid these kind of trust issues, and they are ongoing trust issues, as I'll, as I'll talk about, um, by simply using analog computers. And analog computers are simple mechanical devices that I'll, I'll demo a little bit that uh, will do computations in a way where you know exactly what's happening. Okay, so before I, I jump into that, let me give sort of an overview of hardware wallets and the way that we normally think about hardware wallets. So a hardware wallet, of course, is like a dongle, it's like a ledger or a treasure or a cold card or whatever that you buy. And you store your Bitcoins on it and you connect it over USB or, or maybe you like ferry SD cards between your computer and the thing. And it does signatures on your behalf. So you have the special purpose piece of hardware that you, know, you can't load software onto, or, or at least not without being signed. And so the idea that it shouldn't have malware, it should be designed to handle um, sensitive data, and you, know, you have some control over what's going in and out of it. Right? So what makes a good hardware wallet? Well, if you go on like our Bitcoin, you'll get advice like the following. And this is good advice, to be clear, but it, it's fairly basic. right? They'll say, get one of the popular hardware wallets that's run by some, that's manufactured by somebody who you trust. Um, when you receive it, you know, make sure that the, you know, it's sealed properly. Um, if it comes with a list of pre-filled seed words, then you have some sort of supply chain issue <laughs> and you should throw it out. And you certainly should not use those seed words. Um, I'm laughing, but by the way, that is a real very common supply chain attack. If you buy a hardware wallet from Amazon or whatever, the Amazon shipper will just stick a piece of paper in saying, please use these seed words. It's very easy for them, but it gets people, right? So, so don't do that. Um, so OK, so there's, there's good advice for buying a hardware wallet, right? But you know, we're MIT students here, so we can maybe be a little bit more technical and look into how are these things assembled. Some devices have secure elements, which are these sort of proprietary chips that are designed to be resilient against various um, means of breaking them open and extracting data and things like this versus an ordinary computer chip, which is, is not designed to be adversarial against a physical attacker, right? And then maybe you care about what kind of software is running on it, right? You want it to work using PSBT rather than some random ad hoc protocol. Maybe you want all the latest goodies. You want it to support Taproot or multi-signatures or descriptors or whatever the latest hotness is and so on. Maybe you want to download the source code. It should be open source, you know. I, I could go on for, for quite a while, but all these different things that you could think about and the unfortunate thing is that there's nothing, there's nothing on the market that checks all of the boxes that I'm describing. And so there's a good chance that if you're thinking at this level, you're not going to make a different decision than if you were just you know, buying the most popular thing, but you will feel less secure about it. And that's sort of a theme here, that the more you know, the less comfortable you're going to feel about how you're storing all your Bitcoins. All right? So there's another layer down the rabbit hole we could go. And if you hang out on the right IRC channels or, or spend time with a lot of Bitcoin OGs, you'll find advice like this, where um, like famously Greg Maxwell advocates uh, using an old ThinkPad or like an old laptop that, would, that you purchased before Bitcoin was a thing. And it's not going to be backdoored in any way that would be Bitcoin specific because nobody knew that Bitcoin would be a thing back when it was manufactured. There are also various people who, uh, who file bugs on libsecb saying it doesn't work on 8-bit processors and so on, because they are trying to run Bitcoin software on their Game Boys or their Nintendos or uh, old calculators. I think most people in this room probably use like a TI-83, right? So before the TI-83, there was a TI-85, which is an even more primitive TI graphing calculator that you used to have to use in school. Um, and you can run Bitcoin on this, right? You can implement cryptography and TI basic and, and do that and presumably your TI calculator is not backdoored in some way. Um, and it's also like, it's just a good disguise, right? 
You know, if you're one of these people, you've probably got a house full of old, crappy electronics, half of which doesn't even turn on. And if something in the pile is secretly your Bitcoin wallet, well, nobody's going to target it, right? So that's something. It's not bad advice, you know? Like, if you, uh, if you have the means and the, uh, the motivation, I certainly would advocate doing this. But let's go a little bit deeper down the rabbit hole here, okay? So what I'm going to advocate here is rather than dealing with you know, this, this electronic hardware that perhaps is you know, older than Bitcoin and unlikely to be backdoored, it's still got you know, chips, it's still got flash memory, chances are, and it might have some wear leveling logic or, or something like that. You still can't really tell what it's doing and, and ensure yourself that it's not storing anything or doesn't have side channels or whatever. But if we instead use paper and metal, and I mean like large chunks of metal that you can see and manipulate with your hands, then you have a pretty good physical intuition about what your, uh, what your side channels might be. You have some assurance that this, you know, the laws of chemistry are not backdoored in a way that will undermine your Bitcoins. And if they are, <laughs> you're like, forget about it, right? Like, there's, no, there's no hope for you or anyone. So, but it's not, right? That's, that's, like, that's good authority. It's in the Bible. So, and then the other benefit of this is that if you're doing all these computations by hand, right, all your intermediate computations are going to be on worksheets. They're going to be on, on paper that you, you write out. So what you can do is you can take your final computations, you can store them in a crypto steel or something so it's physically, physically encoded, and all your intermediate computations you just set fire to. Okay? You've got a whole bunch of worksheets, you just burn them, they're gone, that's the end of that. Okay? So I'm going to come back to this in the, in the second half of my talk and show some pictures and, and spin some wheels up here and, and do some kind of stuff. But let me do a bit of a digression to try to justify this mode of thinking and this trust model to people who are not like innately metalheads or steampunks. So the first thing I want to emphasize is that this is an ongoing, like a continual thing. So if you're storing Bitcoins for a long time, say like years or decades even, then there's kind of a continual trust requirement in how you manage your stored secrets, right? So there's a question of, well, what kind of hardware should you be using if you're going to be using hardware wallets, right? Um, so maybe you have a hardware wallet that you like now, but maybe in five years it doesn't work anymore, okay? So should you just buy a new one every five or 10 years and have an ongoing, you know, keep trusting that uh, every time you purchase a new hardware wallet, there's not going to be any problems forever? Should you buy a dozen right now and then just kind of cycle through them and hope that there won't be new issues found in the old hardware that you're using? Or maybe that'll become unpopular enough that nobody's going to bother targeting? I mean, there, there are arguments for both sides, right? And like, certainly it doesn't seem safe to be using stuff that you're never updating because you're not going to get security updates and stuff. But on the flip side, if you are continually updating stuff, then you have kind of a new trust requirement and a new... Um, new opportunity for bugs to slip in that might cause you problems, right? So you have to think about this um, for the hardware you're buying, you think about this for the firmware updates that you put on that hardware. Uh, you think about it in general for like, what is your process for testing your backups, if you even have one, right? Maybe you've got these crypto steals and maybe you just trust that the tiles won't move if nobody opens it. And I mean, that certainly makes a, a, an amount of physical sense, but it's uncomfortable, right? If you have all the stuff stored in a crypto steal and it's got a tamper-proof sticker on it, and you just store it for 20 years, you know, and the last time you looked at it was 20 years ago, I don't know, do you, do you, how much faith do you have that, uh, that really nothing has changed out from under you? Um, so these are scary questions, and, and they, these are not necessarily like rational things to worry about, or there, there's certainly different degrees of plausibility and so on, but they are an ongoing source of discomfort and an ongoing question that you have to answer for yourself, okay? So let me talk a bit more about like, what specific things you might see go wrong with, with hardware wallets um, and the different directions that, uh, that you might uh, need to worry in. Um, so kind of the, the classic direct things is if your hardware wallet fails, there are a few ways that it can fail that are, that are sort of obvious and that they're, they're direct ways, right? So one thing is if you let the hardware wallet generate your key material, and most of them will, right? Like you just say, like, generate me a new seed and we'll give you some seed words. If those seed words are bad, if they're low entropy or they're copied or they're, they're backdoored in any way, then it's just game over, right? So that's unfortunate. Um, as I said, like, it's not 
I haven't heard of this happening with Bitcoin wallets in the wild. This happened with an Android wallet a very long time ago. It used a, a bad RNG. Um, but uh, well, with hardware wallets, as I said, like the most common thing is somebody just like literally prints a paper with a bad seed on it and advises you to use it, which is, is much easier to pull off. Um, another thing is they could just sign transactions, right? It's plugged into your computer. Somebody figures out how to bypass the screen that shows you the address and destination and stuff, and then it signs off all your coins that you don't even know about, right? And ultimately, it could just directly leak your key material, right? Maybe there's some really serious bugs, some buffer overflow or whatever, and you have some malware on your computer, it breaks into the hardware wallet, it gets your key material out, okay? Game over. Um, but then there's more su subtle things that you might not think about unless you work on hardware wallets or, or you do security modeling for a living, right? So one that, that worries me personally is this first one, which is that you have storage. Um, anywhere that key material is stored, even temporarily, potentially it won't be erased. So like if you have a, a SSD in your computer, the SSD itself has where leveling logic, where after a certain cell has been written to or, or read from a certain number of times, the drive itself will say, well, that, that cell's gone bad, so we're not going to use it anymore. And the, the drive actually comes with more capacity than it advertises, so it has room to kind of expire various cells, and it'll last for quite a while, because there's a, a stochastic process in which of these fail. So if you have your key material stored somewhere, and then you go to delete it, by overwriting it with zeros or random data, or whatever have you. But between you storing the key material and you overwriting it with zeros, the drive decides that it's not going to use that cell anymore, then you're not going to overwrite it. You'll overwrite some other random part of the drive. And then much later, you know, you throw it in the trash and somebody with an electron microscope gets a hold of it somehow, um, which can happen if you're a visible Bitcoin developer. You know, people will try stuff like this. Uh, and now they've got your key material and now they can steal your coins, right? And there's, nothing, there's no way that you can tell unless you get an electron microscope yourself and then load your key material into your electron microscope software, which I can assure you is not written by cryptographers, and then detect whether or not you can find it anywhere on your drive, and then I guess point the electron microscope at its own storage and try to, try to do some sort of Douglas Hofstadter thing there. It's, uh, it's expensive, it's complicated, and I'm pretty sure none of us have ever done this. Um, Another more subtle thing, right, you might sign things it shouldn't, right? If you can trick the hardware wallet, you can find a bug where it will show something on the screen, but actually what it's signing is something different from that, then you lose coins, right? You don't want those kind of bugs. Um, and then the final thing here is a side channel issue. And this is something where if you have an air-gapped hardware wallet, you don't have to worry about this, but if it's plugged into your computer over USB and you have malware on your computer, it can do stuff like request a signature and then listen to figure out how long it takes to sign. And it may turn out that the hardware wallet will take a different amount of time to sign a transaction, depending on the pattern of zeros and ones in your secret key. And you can detect those timing differences, and then you can infer information about the secret key that way and kind of extract stuff. So timing is a classic side channel, so is power draw. If you've got malware that has direct access to your USB bus and can measure this, or if you have an attacker who's just physically stolen your device and has connected it to an oscilloscope, right? You can measure all sorts of things. You can measure like, you know, the electromagnetic waves that are emanating from the, the wallet as it's doing computations. Um, all manner of things. So there are all these kind of, this is the nature of doing these high frequency electronic um, things is that you're going to leak what you're doing, right? No matter how much you try to harden the, the hardware. Um, and this is one, like, a, a sort of a general reason to distrust electronics, right? It moves very quickly. It's working with secret data. It's designed to be low power and fast, and that there's often a trade-off between being constant time and, and side channel resilient and, uh, and those things, and fast, right, and low power. So let's get into the meat of this talk. And actually, most of my slides from here on out are going to be pictures. So. Uh, I'm, not, I'm going to try to make this not super technical. There's no way in 20 minutes I can show how to, to actually use this scheme. So I'm just going to try to justify it and then show some pictures and then give you guys some links where you can go find some more. So here is the most technical slide that I've got where we are going to define the word volvel. So a volvel is a physical computer that is formed by two pieces of paper that rotate relative to each other. Okay, and I'll show some more pictures closer up. Um, and this is just connected by a brad, right? I printed this off on my, my home printer. Um, I use an X-Acto knife to cut out a bunch of little windows, and you can see that as it turns, different values are appearing through the windows there. 
Okay, um, and these, this kind of computer, I think, basically dates back for as long as we have any historical artifacts. But Wikipedia claimed that these volvos, in particular, um, came from a um, particular scholar who developed a whole bunch of like new volvo tech around 1000 AD. Um, and then they have actually a history of being used for cryptography. There's a 1980 article by uh, David Kahn, who wrote The Code Breakers, which is like the classic uh, history of crypto book, where he talks about how throughout kind of the Middle Ages, there was a lot of usage of volvos for crypto for, as like substitution ciphers, or cryptograms is, is what we're familiar with, right? So you could take something like this disk here, where you can see I've got an inner wheel, and then all the symbols there point to symbols on the outer wheel. And I can literally just translate character by character and do kind of like a, a primitive version of encryption, doing stuff like that. And in fact, there was some uh, cryptographer called Alberti in, uh, sometime in the 1400s who was actually doing this. And this is one of the, the really historical examples of uh, substitution ciphers being used. Um, but then we can do all sorts of new stuff. And I'm just going to run through all these things. You can do error correction codes. You can do polynomial interpretation, blah, blah, blah. You can do a whole bunch of mathematics just using these wheels. OK? So here's a close-up picture of an old version of the Volvo that I just showed you here. So you can see up close, right? You have a pointer up at the top. You point it to some particular number. And what this is doing is, is an operation we call addition, although it's not quite like the addition you're, you're familiar with. Um, where you just combine two values by turning the pointer to one of them, looking up the, the other one on the front of the wheel, and then seeing what the result is, kind of thing. Okay? Pretty straightforward. Here's a wooden Volvo that my fiance made me for Christmas. Uh, so you can see this is fun for the whole family, right? Um, the wooden one, unfortunately, is actually pretty slow to use, so I, I, I use the paper ones. But, you know, there you go. Um, and then before I go on, I want to share this quote, because I think there's a, an interesting historical lesson here, um, which is not the intended one. So this is a, a Coptic bishop from somewhere in Egypt in like 700 AD, um, had these, these words to say about Hypatia, who was a, a scholar in Alexandria uh, some 300 years before. Um, she was, I mean, she was a pagan. She was a Neoplatonist. You know, there, there's some merit to these, these accusations of, of Platonism, but certainly, um, she was not a witch who was like using astrolabes and like musical instruments, I guess, to, to uh, turn all the children evil. But the cool thing here is that this, uh, this bishop, John here, all he can do is centuries later make impotent accusations of witchcraft when he has no ability to take any of her bitcoins because all her use of these astrolabes has effectively secured them even against 300 years of future technological development. So this is what we should all aspire to. Okay, like somebody in this room in 300 years, I would like to be accused of a witch who, uh, without losing their coin. Okay, I think we can do it. I think we can do it. So here's the scheme. Here's a quick overview of everything that we can do with this scheme. Um, and again, I'm not going to say exactly how, uh, how to use this, but I'll have a link at the end that, that you can follow. Um, Using this, uh, these volvos as well as some worksheets and, um, and an instruction booklet that, uh, that we've written up, you're able to, first of all, generate coins or generate random data just by rolling dice. And even if your dice are biased, um, for example, a lot of cheap dice, uh, especially ones you buy online, in manufacturing, they have these pockets of air in the, in the middle of them just because they're kind of like drop forged or however, however they do it. You wind up with these air pockets that are not symmetrical. And so the dice will not show uh, all six values with equal probability, we have a worksheet that will let you eliminate that source of bias. Okay, and I'll show a picture on the next slide. You can also compute and verify checksums, which give you assurance that your data has not changed. We have what's called the distance nine checksum, which means that once you add these extra 13 characters of um, redundant data, which constitute the checksum, if there are up to eight errors anywhere in the rest of the string, you will be able to detect that that's the case. And that's you, even if there's more with overwhelming probability. Even cooler, if there are up to four errors, it's actually even possible to correct them to determine mathematically what those errors were and what the correct value is, no matter where they appear in the string. So this gives you resilience against, like, if you're loading stuff onto a crypto steel and you use the wrong tile, say, or if it's subjected to heat and, like, you know, maybe one of them is not so easy to read. 
uh, or if you're using paper and you know something gets wet or smudged or you know whatever might happen, this error correcting code will um, will make sure that you're able to recover from that. And then the other big benefit is that using the error correcting code and using these vovels every year or however often you want to check that your data is intact, you can run the checksum verification algorithm by hand, again, burning the intermediate things, and you will know that your data is still intact and it has not changed and nothing's been swapped and nothing's you know, failed or become erased or like you just imagined that you originally loaded it to begin with. So you can have an ongoing assurance that your data is, uh, have integrity without involving any new trust requirements on electronic computers, okay? Um, and then we have Shamir Secret Serum. So you can split yourself, you split your secret up. Um, you choose a threshold value, let's say three. You can split your secret into 10 pieces, hand them out, you know, bury them in, in all 10 corners of the world. And any three of them are sufficient to reconstruct your secret. But if you have only two of them, they have no information about the secret. It's kind of a cool, like, just like threshold that happens there. Uh, so you can split your secrets up using this scheme. You can bring them back together using this scheme, okay? Again, no electronic computers here. Um, and then also, if you split your thing up into two pieces and you set your threshold to two, you can actually do encryption that way. You can say, well, one of the secret is the encrypted data, and, or one of the shares is the encrypted data, the other share is the key, um, and this is particularly useful if you're trying to move physical key data around the world, right? You do this two of two splitting, you take one of the, the pieces on the plane with you to your next destination. If you're like searched by TSA or whatever, you just throw it out and restart, right? It's no, no harm done. Um, if not, just take two trips. You can move your data securely, and now you don't need to worry about customs or TSA or train thieves or you know, whatever you might worry about, um, or mail, mail inspectors, I don't know. Cool, so I'm just gonna run through a couple of pictures here. Um, so this is the dice generation worksheet. You can sort of see how this works. So what we do is you basically you roll a bunch of dice twice, and you extract one bit. So if the second value is greater than the first value, that's a one. If it's less than, that's a zero. So you roll the dice once, you set these markers on the, um, these markers and dice, by the way, came from a children's game, which conveniently had five different colors with markers. It's, uh, it's called math fun. It's the worst game ever, but it's, uh, it works for this. Um, you set some markers where the dice value are, you roll them again, you set the dice where they are, and then you follow that kind of tree on the left and you're able to generate um, a bunch of five-bit values that way. Here's a picture of the vovels, um, the three of them that you use um, for, for all the various computations. Essentially what it is, you use the one on the right to look up what are called recovery symbols. You use the two-sided one on the left, which is a potion. You spin that to your recovery symbol, you flip it over, and then it will translate your shares. And then the middle one you use to add, together, add all the shares together. And that's how you do secret splitting, that's how you do recovery, it's always this like translate and add kind of process. So um, it's actually very mechanical. You don't need to know any of the underlying math to, to follow these instructions. It's actually kind of cathartic and, and kind of fun to do. It takes a while, probably like 30 to 60 minutes to do a, a, a key recovery. Um, but that's is really not bad at all, right? It's not like you're spending a day doing a whole bunch of computations where a single mistake will mess you up, right? Um, you just do it, you can use the checksum, will protect you from mistakes and, and just move forward. And so here's the, the other side of the two-sided one there, right, and here's a, here's a close-up, so you can sort of see um, how these work, right? You can see I just took an X-Acto knife, sliced out some windows, and, and threw these together. Um, so I am pretty much out of time, but in 20 seconds I'll just summarize exactly what I've been saying here. So the benefits of using paper here, right, you have no side channels, you have no EMF, you have none of this kind of stuff. Um, you can understand and verify how this stuff works, and I think there's a, a huge psychological benefit to that, really, that, that you know what your secret, like what's happening to your secret key material as it's going through the checksumming and splitting and recovery processes like that. You can like feel it as very tangible. If you want it to go away, you know, you just you make it go away. Uh, rather than requesting some disk controller, please overwrite it for you, you just throw it into a campfire, and, uh, and God will take care of it. And, uh, and then the other thing is this stuff will continue to work, right? It's not going to become obsolete. You know, it's, it's all like very straightforward mathematics, believe it or not. It's all just like polynomial uh, interpolation. It was developed, you know, 200 years ago, most of it. And, uh, and it will just continue to work. And you can even reconstruct the scheme, really. If you, if you knew a bit of the math, you could, you know, infer how the vovels are constructed and just do it. And you, actually, you don't even need the vovels. You can do it with lookup tables. You can do it by hand, right? So, so, um, the, uh, the name that I'm using on this project is Prowert Sneed, which is an anagram of Andrew Polstra, 
my co-author, Leon Olson Kerr, which is also an anagram. I, I encourage you to try to undo it uh, and find out who he is. Um, the two of us have this repo on GitHub, um, which uh, has the, the Postscript file that will generate all of this stuff for you, or, or that is all of this stuff for you. Uh, we're, we're always happy to see issues and discussions and, and whatever feedback you might have. Uh, at some point this year, we will you know, do some professionally bound versions of this. We still have some more iteration on the artwork and the instructions and stuff, but we're going to have some bound versions that you can buy online if you want. Um, and uh, yeah, just one last tiny thing is to show you what these look like before they're printed out, right? We just have this nice glossy paper, right? They look very pretty, right? You cut these out, you fold them together, you know? You need a brass fastener, um, but other than that, you know, there's no, no uh, glue or anything like that. Um, nothing, nothing complicated, just ordinary art supplies. So, thank you all for listening. That's it. <laughs>